Let's go ahead and welcome in the autonomic nervous system. Um, we have a pretty decent idea about the uh, nervous system, but now, you know, how neurons work, what cells are where, right? we have a pretty generalized idea about the differences between the functional and structural organization of the nervous system, but I'm gonna review a little bit with you here, right? Um, the autonomic nervous system is going to be part of your overall nervous system when we're talking about the functionality uh, or the physiology of the nervous system. You have the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. And so I'm going to talk, I'm going to kind of review the somatic a little bit here with you in a moment. Um, but when we start off talking about the organization of the overall nervous system from a structural standpoint, that's more or less the anatomy of the nervous system, you have a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system includes the brain, and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system is everything else, which is pretty much the nerves and the ganglia. And we all know what a ganglia is, it's a cluster of cell bodies out in the periphery of the, uh, in the peripheral nervous system there. When we talk about functionally, all right, when we break down our nervous system, we have the somatic nervous system, and then we have our autonomic nervous system. And so that's what we're gonna go over tonight, is we're gonna start to learn a little bit here and there of what the autonomic nervous system is, how it functions. So when you think of the autonomic nervous system, think of autopilot, stuff that you wouldn't have to worry about autopilot. Okay, like with cruise control in your car, you don't have to worry about applying the gas because it'll maintain the speed. So all the functions of how cruise control works, right, is going to really be uh, involuntary because the car is doing all the driving. So here, when we're talking about the autonomic nervous system, it's going to be the nerves involved in involuntary actions there. It's important for homeostasis. We want to maintain our normal homeostasis, all right, which is going to include all right, regulation of the organs of our body, all right, and maintaining normal internal functions, making sure the trains run on time, making sure that your heart is beating enough blood for your tissues to sustain normal metabolic processes. The autonomic nervous system takes care of all of this stuff. So we break down the autonomic nervous system into two parts, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. And we'll talk about those. Sympathetic division is like the fight or flight, emergency, exercise, and parasympathetic is gonna be rest and digest. What happens maybe after you eat a big meal, all right? Uh, if you're trying to recover from a good workout that you had, right? So it's really important all right, that we understand these differences and we'll talk about it. So we're gonna see which parts of the autonomic nervous system relate to stress and which parts relate to resting. All right, so quick uh, review of the somatic nervous system when we're talking about the functionality of it, right? If you recall, the nervous system has a sensory component to it and a motor component. So when we talk about something that's consciously perceived, what we're dealing with is sensations that you realize are going on. Sight, or excuse me, vision, hearing, touch, taste, vibration, pain, temperature. All of those are consciously perceived. And all of those, all right, you will perceive through the somatic nervous system. Right. The motor component has to deal with, all right, the skeletal muscle, things that you can voluntarily control. So when we talk about consciously controlled processes, basically what we're saying is, all right, these are the processes that you can voluntarily control in regards to a specific type of effector. And the only type of effector that we can consciously and voluntarily control is skeletal muscle tissue. We can't control cardiac muscle tissue voluntarily. We can't control smooth muscle tissue voluntarily, and we can't control our glands, right? So, Really easy, somatic nervous system, the effector organ is gonna be skeletal muscle. All right, so when we talk about the sensory, right, keep in mind our special senses, we'll talk more about this in the next chapter, in chapter 16, that includes, you know, uh, taste, touch, uh, uh, equilibrium, smell, anything that comes from the skin, pain, temperature, vibration, light touch, 
discriminative touch, all of that, again, will uh, travel on the somatic sensory. Also, there's that word again, proprioceptors. Basically, that is going to be these receptors that are located on the periphery, which tell your brain what joints and muscles are doing. If something's flexed, if something's extended, if something's abducted, supinated, dorsiflexed, whatever. Proprioceptors tell the brain, all right, or excuse me, the central nervous system, what is happening, okay? Somatic motor is gonna be our consciously controlled voluntary processes that rely on skeletal muscles. And as we know, all right, those uh, um, uh, action potentials and nerve, uh, and nerve impulses originate in the cerebrum. And also when we're dealing with the somatic motor, we'll be dealing with reflexes. And we talked the uh, uh, last chapter in chapter 14 about the spinal reflexes, right? But when we're dealing with reflexes of the brainstem, what we call cranial reflexes, right? That'll involve our cranial nerves, which we've already learned about. So here's just a kind of review of the outline of how our somatic system, our, remote, our nervous system operates. Okay, you have a receptor somewhere out in the periphery. In this example, we're using the skin. It's a Pacinian corpuscle, which is gonna be related for touch. So it transmits that touch sensation up through the sensory neuron, okay, into the spinal nerve, into the spinal, excuse me, the dorsal or posterior root, and into the, the uh, spinal, cord. And then that information is processed, interpreted, processed, and then decided upon what the outcome is going to be. Once that outcome is decided, we're now going to stimulate our effector organ, right? And we're going to use our motor neuron for that. The motor neuron is going to exit out of the spinal cord. The cell body of that motor neuron will be found in the anterior gray horn of our spinal cord. It'll exit out through the anterior root, because there's only motor neurons present in the anterior root, and then it will enter into the spinal nerve and then travel all the way, right, to the effector organ. Since we're dealing with the somatic nervous system, our only effector organ is going to be skeletal muscle. So that leads me, perfect segue, into the autonomic nervous system, okay? Autopilot, things that, that operate below our consciousness level. We also call all right, the autonomic nervous system the autonomic motor or visceral motor system. So these processes, and if you think about it, I would really hate to be bothered with every little detail on how every single system in my body operates. You know, do I really want to be bothered by how many rest, uh, uh, breaths I take in a minute or how many times my heart beats? All right in a minute. I, I want to I defer that to a, a system that is going to take care of that for me, and the autonomic nervous system is going to be that system, all right? So all of these processes are going to be below our consciousness level, all right? So those effectors I was telling you about, cardiac muscle tissue, smooth muscle tissue, and glands are going to receive all of their input, their motor, excuse me, their motor output information comes from the central nervous system to those effector organs. So, I mean, we'll see this all the time, all right? When we're talking about a lot of these different systems in our body, you will have the benefit of learning about all that, all right, in bio 211, when we're talking about certain specific systems, I'll give a broad overview on some of the general uh, parts, but you'll go into more detail uh, in the latter half of bio 211, all right? So, Basically, our autonomic nervous system, right, the motor aspect, is going to respond to all of that visceral sensory input that it receives. So, for example, right, if there's an increased stretch in the stomach wall because you just ate a pizza, right, the central nervous system gets that information through the visceral sensory input that it receives from the sensory neurons coming from the stomach. And then it'll be processed there in the central nervous system, in the brainstem specifically. And then your central nervous system, the control center is going to figure out, all right, so there's an increase in stretch on the stomach wall. I need to start to digest whatever's in the stomach. So it's gonna send that motor output down to the organ specifically to the viscera. And it's gonna tell the viscera, okay, Stomach, 
we need to start increasing the motility of the muscles so we can start churning and, and breaking up that material. We're gonna start increasing our gastric digestive, digestive enzymes. And so, so we can eventually move all this stuff into the small intestine where we can get a lot of digestion and absorption of these nutrients going on. And the big purpose for our autonomic nervous system is for this fellow right here, to maintain our homeostasis, okay? If our heartbeat gets too high, your nervous system is going to take measures to decrease your heart rate, all right? Blood pressure, okay? As a result of exercise, yes, of course, your blood pressure is going to increase, but we wanna keep blood pressure within a normal range, which is on average about 120 over 80 is the average. But there's a range that blood pressure is considered to be okay in. 90 over 60 is the minimum, 140 over 90 is the maximum. Temperature is the same way. We're always trying to shoot for 98.6. But again, we're dealing with the range, okay? The minimum is 96.4, the maximum is 99.1. If we get above that, 101, 102, then we're concerned, right? And there's something going on. But our autonomic nervous system is always going to try to keep all right, a lot of the physiological functions inside the body within these optimal ranges here, okay? Because that helps to confer or maintain that homeostasis, that healthy balance that's going on. So when we're looking here at uh, an outline of our autonomic nervous system, all right, we'll use the respiratory, the lungs here as our organ. All right, so we have sensory neurons and receptors located throughout the viscera here of our, of, our, of our lungs here. And so they'll tell like how much stretch is going on in, in the tissues of the lungs. Um, what's going on with the blood vessels? Do we need to get more blood into the lungs to get oxygenated or do we need to get less blood? So that information is going to travel on our sensory neurons, okay, similar to what we saw in the somatic nervous system, up into the spinal cord. So it's the same story. Sensory neuron right, is gonna carry that sensory input to our central nervous system here. Now where things take a turn and get different for the autonomic nervous system is when we're dealing here with the motor output pathway. Right. So it's a little bit more complicated and that's what tonight's uh, lecture is gonna be about. We're gonna talk about okay, the differences here in, in the components here of our autonomic nervous system. But you can see, first of all, there's two neurons in our motor output chain here. But the point being is, right, we're still going to send that motor output information back down to the viscera in response to whatever, to whatever sensory information came from the viscera. So if you're breathing too fast and you wanna slow things down, then that's what the motor, uh, the autonomic motor neurons are gonna do. They're gonna send that information from the central nervous system. Okay, slow the breathing down, slow the breathing down, right? So we're gonna go through some of those pathways tonight and discuss some of the differences that we've seen, okay, between certain parts of the autonomic nervous system. And you'll see a few differences between the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system. So just to review, our somatic nervous system, when we're dealing with our lower motor neurons, remember our lower motor neuron is a neuron that for, for normally is going to exit out from the spinal cord out to the effector organ. So that's what we see here, all right? Our lower motor neuron, which is only one, one single lower motor neuron, which is gonna exit out from the central nervous system that can either be from the brain stem or from the spinal cord, and it will go out to the effector organ, okay? So the cell body of our, of our lower motor neuron is either going to be in the brain stem, think cranial nerve, or in the spinal cord, then think spinal nerve. All right. These neurons are going to be big, okay? And they're going to be myelinated. So what does that tell you? That should tell you that these messages are going to travel fast. Myelination increases the speed of an action potential, and the larger the diameter of a nerve or neuron, all right, the faster that action potential will travel down. And, all right, since our effector organ is skeletal muscle, we already know what the neurotransmitter is. It's acetylcholine. And once acetylcholine gets released, all right, 
and it acts upon the skeletal muscle, it will excite that skeletal muscle to contract. So that should be all review for you. All right, so let's compare that now to the autonomic nervous system. We're gonna see a difference between the lower motor neurons of the somatic nervous system compared to the lower motor neurons of the autonomic nervous system. So when we're dealing with the lower motor neurons of the autonomic nervous system, we're gonna deal with a chain of two motor neurons. So instead of one motor neuron going out to the effector, now we're dealing with two. So the first one we call the preganglionic neuron. So same story, the cell body of that first neuron is gonna be found either in the brain stem or the spinal cord. Okay, similar to the somatic nervous system. I'm good with that. Also, these axons will be myelinated, but they won't be large, they're gonna be thinner. All right, a little bit smaller. So these axons all right, will exit out of the brain stem or spinal cord, and they're going to go to a ganglion. But since we're dealing with the autonomic nervous system, let's call these ganglions the autonomic ganglion, just so we know. So when I say autonomic ganglion, you're like, oh, dang. All right, we're talking about the autonomic nervous system. Perfect. So these preganglionic neurons are going to exit out of the central nervous system, and they're going to project to an autonomic ganglion somewhere in the periphery, in the peripheral nervous system. Well, we already know what makes up the peripheral nervous system, ganglia and nerves. Okay, so we're pretty good there. And then finally, this preganglionic neuron is going to release the same neurotransmitter as our lower motor neuron in the somatic nervous system, acetylcholine and it will release it onto the second neuron in our chain, but it will excite. So it's excitatory. Same thing that we saw previously in the somatic nervous system. So, okay, not too bad. Feel pretty confident now. But now we're gonna get and deal with our second neuron in our chain, and we call that the postganglionic neuron. Let me be specific. I call it the postganglionic neuron. It's just easier so people don't get confused. All right, ganglionic, and versus postganglionic, it's up to you, okay? But I like to use preganglionic neuron for the first neuron, postganglionic neuron for the second one. So the cell body of the postganglionic neuron is gonna be in that autonomic ganglion where the preganglionic neuron synapsed on, right? So a little bit different now with well, the, the actual physicality of these neurons, they're even smaller than the preganglionic neuron and they're unmyelinated. And so they're gonna leave and exit the autonomic ganglion and, and go out to the effector organ. So I'm gonna repeat myself here because if you don't know it by now, folks, you have to know the effectors of the autonomic nervous system. Cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or gland, those are going to be your effectors, things that you can't control. And lastly, all right, the postganglionic neuron is going to release all right, either acetylcholine, or now we have a new uh, neurotransmitter, norepinephrine. Now the difference here is, okay, th this uh, neuron here, can either excite or inhibit the effector depending on which receptors are going to be activated on the effector by which neurotransmitter was released. Point being is understand that the postganglionic neuron can either inhibit the effector or it can excite the effector, which is good and bad. Well, I'm not gonna say good or bad, but sometimes you wanna shut things off. When it's time to stop digestion, okay? We need to turn the stomach off. All right, all right, stomach, no more. There's no more need to make any more stomach acid. So we're gonna shut you off. So that's where this, this concept comes into play, all right? Very, very helpful. So this picture here, I'm really gonna encourage you to know this picture inside and out, figure 15-2. Here's our central nervous system, specifically our spinal cord. You'll see, all right, this is talking about 
our lower motor neuron chain and the autonomic nervous system here. So our first all right, neuron in our lower motor neuron chain, its cell body is gonna be located here in the lateral horn. This is the anterior gray horn. The cell bodies, the somatic motor neurons are located here. Right? The cell bodies for our autonomic lower motor neurons are gonna be located in the lateral horn. Big difference, know that. All right, so our preganglionic neuron exits out of the spinal cord through the anterior root here into our spinal nerve, and it goes out to the periphery. And it winds up located in autonomic ganglion, and it synapses onto the postganglionic neuron here in our autonomic ganglion. And so it releases its acetylcholine, and it's going to excite our postganglionic axon. And so that postganglionic axon is going to travel out to the effector organ, and it is going to release either acetylcholine or norepinephrine and have an inhibitory or an excitatory effect onto our effector organ, which is cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or a gland. This is a great picture. If you understand this picture, then you'll understand, all right, at least the basic premise of how the autonomic nervous system functions. Okay, we're gonna get into a little bit more of specifics here in a moment. All right, so the nice thing about the autonomic nervous system using this chain system of two neurons, all right, compared to the somatic nervous system using just the one, are these two concepts here. One's called neur neuronal convergence. So we'll see many preganglionic neurons synapsing onto one ganglionic neuron. So if you were to damage a certain part of your body, all right, and you, uh, um, you, and you still have other parts of your body still functioning, all right, the pregangliotic neurons from the other parts of the body can still synapse onto that one ganglion or postganglionic neuron. So we can still get certain activities uh, done. So the neur neuronal convergence is very helpful. Neuronal divergence is, how, is, is great because we'll see, all right, branches from the axon of one of our preganglionic neurons are going to synapse on many, because remember, the, the ganglion, I don't have a good picture here. Hold on. I'm going to come right back, I promise you. Here, if I zoom in here, our preganglionic neuron right here, you can see it has several axon collaterals that come off. And so they could be stimulating other neurons all over the place. And you can get what's called the mass effect. We'll talk more about that in detail. All right, so one preganglionic neuron can actually stimulate or excite or inhibit, all right, many multiple numerous postganglionic neurons. So that's where that neuronal divergence comes into play. All right, so when we're talking about our cranial, excuse me, our cranial nervous system, our central nervous system, uh, and it's in the autonomic nervous system, how they relate to each other, right? Several structures in our central nervous system are going to play a big role in regulation of the autonomic nervous system. And we've talked about this just a little bit, but just to remind you, the hypothalamus, again, if ever in doubt, this structure here plays a huge role in a lot of varying functions inside of your body, All right? For example, we saw how it pretty much runs the endocrine system, how it's going to play a big role in the autonomic nervous system, thirst and taste, right? Huge. Um, so we'll see when we're talking about emotions, remember the limbic system, All right? The hypothalamus, plays a, a large role in our emotional processing through the autonomic nervous system uh, with fight or flight. For example, you're getting chased by a bear. Are you happy that the bear is chasing you? Do you think it's funny that the bear is chasing you and trying to eat you? No, you're terrified, you're scared, you are fearful. So the hypothalamus helps to process those emotions and it will help you with the fight or flight response to that dangerous stimuli there. So this emotional response is gonna be governed through the cortex. Well, that makes sense. The frontal lobe there, which is your reasoning, decision-making, personality, 
all right, the thalamus, our relay center. And of course, whenever you hear me mention anything about the emotions in the, in the nervous system, you should be thinking the limbic system, okay? The limbic system is involved in emotions. All right, also our brainstem. We talked about the different parts of the brainstem, the midbrain, the pons, the medulla oblongata, specifically the medulla oblongata, because it contains multiple, many nuclei that are gonna be involved in your visceral reflexes, okay? Cardiac output, for example, all right? Some of the brainstem nuclei there are going to help influence, all right, the heart rate, increase it, decrease it. Uh, it will also play a role in how hard the heart's contracting, okay? Vasomotor control when we're uh, dealing with blood pressure, okay? So we'll see all these different nuclei scattered throughout the, the brainstem that will play a role in the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. And we'll even see um, near the end of this chapter how the spinal cord plays a role in some of the autonomic nervous system reflexes. Defecation, that's pooping. Urination, which is peeing, all right, is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous, uh, parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. And we'll, go, we'll get a chance to talk about all that. All right, so let's talk about some of these functional differences between, okay, the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system. So we have the parasympathetic division and the sympathetic division. Fight or flight for the sympathetic, rest and digest for parasympathetic. So think about what's going on, right? When you've just had a big meal, you're gonna sit down, put your feet up, you know, watch a little bit of who's the boss on TV and uh, you're digesting that big meal that you had. You're activating and stimulating that parasympathetic nervous system. And it is going to start to restore any nutrients, energy reserves, anything that you may have depleted, because let's say before you sat down, all right, to watch who's the boss, and prior to you eating, you went for a six mile run, and you've depleted a significant amount of your energy reserves, all right, in your tissues. So the parasympathetic uh, uh, division is going to restore that. And also at the same time, it's going to help to conserve energy, which is great. Too many people in our society, spend way too much time stimulating their sympathetic division, that fight or flight, that excitement, all right, emergency scenario, or, or well, not enough for the exercise. But, and what happens is you can start to get, all right, some adverse health effects because you're spending too much time with your sympathetic uh, nervous system turned on, where, where we should be stimulating is the parasympathetic division, the rest and digest, the take it easy and relax part. So when we talk about the sympathetic division, we're going to stimulate that when we're exercising, okay, going for a run, a brisk walk, jogging, okay, maybe you want to go for a bike ride, you're getting chased by a bear, okay, you better turn it on because that's an emergency and you got to get out of there, right? Or maybe when you were a little kid and it was the night before your birthday and you got butterflies in your stomach and you couldn't wait to open up your presents, right? Or maybe just have cake. You, all of that will stimulate the sympathetic division there, that fight or flight. So this slide here is showing us the differences between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over the, the parasympathetic and then I'm gonna show you a really cool picture and then we'll do the sympathetic. Parasympathetic is also known as the cranial sacral division. That means that some of our preganglionic neurons are going to come from the brainstem. And then sacral portion, right, some of those preganglionic neurons are going to come from the sacral division of your spinal cord. And that's what this slide here is saying. Preganglionic neurons come from the brainstem. Think cranial nerves. We'll learn these cranial nerves in a minute. Three, seven, nine, and ten. And then the sacral division comes from S2, S3, and S4 off the spinal cord. Way, way, way near the bottom there. All right. So keep in mind, all right, we have a two neuron chain when we're dealing with the autonomic nervous system. The preganglionic axons in the parasympathetic division are long. And the postganglion axons are short. So because the postganglionic axons are short, the ganglia are going to be close 
or in some situations, actually within or inside the effector organ. And our preganglionic axons will have few branches there. So let's show you a picture. Here is an awesome picture, 15-4 is the figure. And if you look in here, you can see on the left side, here's our parasympathetic division, also known as the cranial sacral. So the cranial part involves these four cranial nerves. They all come off of the brain stem, hence cranial. Okay, we'll go in these later on. Come down here to the inferior portion of your spinal cord, you've got S2, S3, and S4 segments coming off of the spinal cord, which will help to form your pelvic splanchnic nerves. More on that in a few moments. All right, those are the second part or the other half of the cranial sacral division. All right, so the functions always is to maintain homeostasis, and it does so when you are resting and digesting. All right, our autonomic nervous system, priority one, is to maintain homeostasis, proper working order of our physiological functions in our body. All right, so the parasympathetic does it best right, when you're resting and, and digesting, when you are replenishing any ex, expired energy reserves, and when you're trying to conserve energy. So if you come down here and take a peek, at what our parasympathetic division looks like, and we're talking about our two neuron chain, right, you can see the preganglionic axon is nice and long, but the, the postganglionic axon is short. So it makes sense to have our autonomic ganglia close to the effector or actually inside the effector. And when we talk about the one that's inside of the effector, We'll talk about these other uh, names for these ganglia over here. So that's the sympathetic. All right. Oh, excuse me. That's the parasympathetic. The sympathetic, also known as the thoracolumbar, and that's because the preganglionic neurons are going to exit out of the thoracic and the upper lumbar portion of your spinal cord from T1 to L2. Specifically, they're going to exit out of the lateral gray horns, right? So that's where they come from, the thoracic or the thoracic segments and in a couple of the lumbar segments. So hence we call it thoracolumbar division. So our preganglionic axons are short, which is opposite of the parasympathetic, and the postganglionic axons are long. So because of our preganglionic axons being short, we're going to see the, the ganglia are going to be close to our spinal cord, to the spine itself. All right. And then our preganglionic axons are going to have many branches. You heard me talking about that neuronal divergence there. So let's zoom in and check out the sympathetic division here. So here you can see thoracolumbar division. And you can see here in the thoracic region of the spine and then part of the lumbar region, right, that's where our preganglionic neurons are going to exit from the spinal cord. And of course, its job is to maintain that homeostasis, but it does it best in fight or flight scenarios, situations in which you are excited, situations in which there's an emergency going on. All right, or if you are exercising, okay. all of that will stimulate all right, an increase of tissue metabolic functions. So we need to provide all right, the correct supply of nutrients or whatever that those tissues need to operate and maintain their homeostasis. So we come down here and look at the sympathetic division, you'll notice the preganglionic neuron is short, whereas the postganglionic neuron is long. And so the autonomic ganglia has to be close to the spinal cord. And we have our axon collaterals. We have lots of branches coming off. So we can get that neuronal divergence there, which leads me to this slide. Because when we're talking about the degree of response, there's a difference between the parasympathetic nervous system 
and the sympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system, all right, its response is going to be pretty localized. And again, that's because there's very few branches that come off of that preganglionic axon. And so it can only affect a few effectors at the same time. Whereas when we're dealing with the sympathetic nervous system, right, the degree of response is going to be what we call mass activation. And the reason why is that preganglionic axon has many branches. And so those many branches can go out and stimulate, all right, or influence, all right, several postganglionic axons, which are eventually then going to affect the effectors. So we can affect many organ systems with very few preganglionic axons. Well, that's huge. That's important. It's very important because, right, if you're getting chased by a bear or you're in a situation that's life-threatening, right, we need to get all hands on deck. We need to make sure that we're able to stimulate as many different tissues or organ systems that will help you to deal with whatever that emergency or whatever uh, that dangerous stimulus could be so you can protect yourself, survive, all right? So the sympathetic nervous system is going to affect your adrenal glands. You remember your adrenal glands, they sit right on top of your kidneys. Specifically, they're going to affect the adrenal medulla. That's the center of the adrenal gland. You've heard of adrenaline, right? Well, we're not gonna call that adrenaline. We're gonna call the hormones that the adrenal medulla produce by their correct name, epinephrine and norepinephrine. But they're going to give you that boost, all right? That will help in situations of exercise or emergency or just when you get excited. All right, let's start off and talk about the first division there of the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic division. All right. Again, keep in mind, we're always going to promote homeostasis. We wanna maintain homeostasis, but this division does it when you got your feet up on the coffee table, all right, watching. I don't know why I keep saying who's the boss. I wanted to come up with a different name, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills or something. All right, so another name for the parasympathetic is that cranial sacral division. And that's because of where, right, the preganglionic axons originate from. And then, right, the preganglionic axons will synapse on the postganglionic axons. And we will then see, all right, the effectors on the end of that. So, the ganglia, there's two types. There's called the terminal ganglia. That's the one that's close to the effector. And then our intramural ganglia, that's the one in which we'll see the ganglia inside the wall of the target organ. Now, if you look at the name intramural, mural, what do you paint a mural on? Most of the time you paint it on a wall. So that's what that means. This intramural ganglion is within the wall of our target organ. See it all the time in the intestines. Perfect example, small intestines, you got intramural ganglia all located all over the place. All right, so let's talk about the divisions first. There's four cranial nerves, ocular motor, facial, glossal pharyngea, and vagus. Memorize those, put those into, all right, your memory banks. These four cranial nerves, all right, are going to play a role in the parasympathetic nervous system. So let's start off with the first one, ocular motor, okay? Remember, two neuron chain. We're dealing with the motor output here. So our preganglionic axons are going to be located, all right, or not the axons, excuse me, uh, the cell bodies of the preganglionic neurons are gonna be located in the brainstem. Cranial nerve three is specifically located in the midbrain. That's the superior uh, portion of the brainstem. So the preganglionic axons are going to exit out of the brainstem and travel to our autonomic ganglion. Our autonomic ganglion is called the ciliary ganglion, and it is located close to the effector organ. So we're going to put that ganglion 
in the orbit, your eye socket, because it's going to affect the eye. So in lab, we talked how the ocular motor nerve is going to stimulate four out of these six extrinsic muscles of the eye. Okay, that's going to be for our voluntarily, our voluntary control, our somatic nervous system. We're going to deal with the parasympathetic component to ocular motor nerve, cranial nerve three. Okay, so in this scenario, the postganglionic axons are going to stimulate the ciliary muscle. This muscle changes the shape of your lens, so you can focus on things. All right, for example, you're driving, you're doing a great job, you're looking straight ahead of you, there's a car about 30 yards in front of you, your following distance is great. I got a moment, I'm going to see what time it is. You look down at your dashboard at the clock there, okay? Your lens and your eye has to change shape. The ciliary muscle does that. It is going to change the shape of your lens. We call that accommodation when you're focused, when you're looking at something far away, then you have to focus on something nearby. The ciliary muscle plays a role in that. Also, all right, the postganglionic axons are going to control, all right, what we call pupillary constriction. All right, it controls this muscle here, the iris sphincter muscle. And you know that sphincters, all right, when they contract, they're going to make, all right, the opening that they surround smaller. So the ocular motor nerve is going to cause pupillary constriction. It makes the pupil smaller. Next cranial nerve is cranial nerve seven, right? The preganglionic axons are going to exit out of the brainstem from the pons. The cell bodies are located in the pons. And so they're going to go out to their autonomic ganglia. There's two autonomic ganglia for the facial nerve the pterygopalatine ganglia, and the submandibular ganglia. One has to do with tears, right, in your eye, and the other ganglia has to do with salivation. So the postganglionic axons that arise from the pterygopalatine ganglia are going to control the lacrimal glands. Those are the glands in your eyes for tears, and also glands that are found within your nose and mouth. And then the postganglionic axons from the submandibular ganglia are going to deal with salivation, but specifically from the submandibular and the sublingual glands. So your facial nerve plays a role in digestion, which is perfect for the crane, uh, for parasympathetic. Remember, rest and digest. So if you smell something good and you notice that your mouth is starting to water, thank you, facial nerve. You're playing a role in that. All right. So that's cranial nerve number seven. Cranial nerve number nine, right? This one here, the cell bodies are going to be located in the medulla oblongata. So the preganglionic axons exit out of the medulla oblongata and they make a beeline towards the ear. And they'll synapse on the otic ganglion. The otic ganglion then has its postganglionic axons exit and stimulate the parotid gland. The parotid gland is your largest salivary gland. So again, the glossopharyngeal nerve will play a role in the production. I shouldn't say again, but again, we're seeing how another cranial nerve, it plays a role in the digestive system. And finally, the vagus nerve. Now, if you recall from lab, when I was going over the vagus nerve, right, it has its hands in everything. And so here, when we're looking at the vagus nerve, right, the cell bodies of the vagus nerve are going to be located in the medulla oblongata. So the preganglionic axons are going to exit from the medulla oblongata. And we don't even list all the ganglia here. We just say a variety of ganglia. And they're located throughout the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity. There's so many of them, right? But they play a role. Okay, in the parasympathetic function of many organs in both of those cavities. For example, the heart helps to slow down the heart, right? Also will help to decrease your respiration rate. We'll also see 
constriction of the bronchioles, okay, that means those airways will start to get smaller, okay, so we'll have less air flowing down into the alveoli sacs. We'll also see an increase in digestive secretions. That's great. That example that I was telling you about with the stomach and it's starting to turn on and produce digestive enzymes, that's all thanks to the vagus nerve there. And then, especially after a period where you've gone and exercised or maybe did a lot of yard work and you've spent a lot of your energy reserves, no problem, okay? The vagus nerve is going to then stimulate the liver to convert your blood glucose or blood sugar into glycogen in the liver and in your skeletal muscles through glucogenesis. So the, the, um, the cranial nerves play a great role. So keep that in mind, the four nerves, cranial nerve three, seven, nine, and 10. It is important that you know those. All right, so that's for the cranial portion. How about the sacral portions? Remember, we have to deal with the cranial sacral division. So let's talk about the inferior portion. All right, so I, I was talking to you how S2 and S3 and S4 are the segments that come off the spinal cord. And these uh, spinal nerves are going to form, all right, and contribute to these structures called the pelvic splanchnic nerves. So we'll see the origins, all right, of these neurons in the lateral, don't forget, lateral gray horn of the spinal cord, okay, specifically at S2, 3, and 4. And so they are going to exit out of the sacral portion of the spinal cord and project out to all right, our autonomic ganglia somewhere in the periphery. And then all right, from there, all right, our post-ganglionic neurons are going to then synapse onto our end organ. So the autonomic ganglia are going to either be a terminal ganglia or an intramural ganglia. So if you think intramural, I always usually automatically think, well, there's gotta be some digestive organs involved here, and there will be. So these spinal nerves, or yeah, the, the spinal segments, S2, 3, and 4, are gonna contribute to the superior and inferior hypogastric plexus, right? A plexus is just a bunch of nerves congregating in an area, okay? And I'll show you a quick picture here. And then our postganglionic axons are going to go to various effector organs in the abdominal cavity and in the pelvic cavity. So if you look here, okay, we're gonna be dealing with smooth muscle. We got plenty of smooth muscle in our digestive system, right? So since we're dealing with the pelvic splanchnic nerves, Right. A lot of the tissues that they're going to innervate when it comes to smooth muscle are going to be at the distal end or the terminal end of your digestive system. All right. We'll also see all right, how it plays a role in increasing secretions in both urinary and digestive systems. Well, that makes sense because they both have to do all right, with when you drink or eat uh, uh, food or liquid for digestion. All right. And then, of course, they play a role in reproduction, so for penile and clitoral erection. So this picture here breaks it down really nicely. Zoom in here. And you can see up at the top here, here are four cranial nerves. And then you can see all the, the various autonomic ganglia here in the areas to which they project to. Look at Vegas. This is what I tell folks. We've got tons of autonomic ganglia, just too many to go off and name. We'd be here for quite some time. But you can see all the various all right, organs and tissues that the vagus nerve is going to innervate. Heart, lungs, part of the liver, stomach, the majority here of the intestines. Right? And what we don't get with the vagus nerve, no problem, look at this. We've got our sacral division, the pelvic splanchnic nerves. They're going to take up the terminal end. And then a couple other structures like the urinary bladder and some of our reproductive organs here. Here's our hypogastric plexus in case you're wondering. Again, 
we just create a whole kind of web of nerves here. Like we like to give ourselves options here. All right, that's the parasympathetic division. So the sympathetic division is going to be similar in, in, in some of these pathways here. And we're gonna talk about what happens when uh, these neurons come off of, of the, the central nervous system. And we're gonna go through and follow them out to their effector organs here. And so it's gonna be an, uh, kind of like a mapping game here that we're gonna play in a second. But quick reminder, sympathetic function, all right? Fight or flight, exercise, emergency, excitement. Where are the origins, all right, of these neurons in the thoracic region of your spinal cord and in the lumbar uh, first and second uh, regions or segments of the spinal cord, hence the name thoracolumbar. And we saw how with the parasympathetic division that the ganglia were close to the actual effector. Well, here our ganglia are going to be close to the central nervous system, specifically the spinal cord. All right, so let's talk about some of these structures. We'll go through the pathway that they take to get to the effector organs, but I want to talk about some of the structures involved in this whole system here. All right, so let's start off with the preganglionic neurons. Where do they originate? The cell bodies are going to be located in the lateral horn, all right, of the spinal cord, and it's found at levels T1 all the way down to L2. And so what we'll see is the axons will exit out of the spinal cord through the anterior roots and then eventually into the spinal nerves, and then they're going to branch off. This is where stuff gets a little bit complicated. So we'll talk about that, probably not tonight, right? but we will talk about it. All right, so <clears throat> there's a structure that sits on either side of your vertebral column, and it's called the sympathetic trunk. Sometimes it's referred to as the sympathetic chain. And it looks like a pearl necklace. So I'm gonna give you a horrible drawing and I apologize for it. So here's a string, then you got a pearl, then you got a string, then you got another pearl, all right? So at each, what you're seeing here is, all right, with our sympathetic trunk, the trunk are the axons that are traveling through this structure. And then of course, we already know what the ganglion is gonna be. It's going to be right, a clustering of cell bodies. And that's usually where our synapses occur. So that's what we're going to see here. And you have a sympathetic trunk right, on each side of the spine. So you have a right sympathetic trunk and you have a left sympathetic trunk. Right? It's literally, I got a picture here. I can find it. There it is. <clears throat> Zoom in. Okay. Here is your spine, the vertebral column. And you can see just outside, here is that sympathetic trunk going along either side here of the spine. You can see where it's thin. This is where the axons are going to be. And then where you'll see some bulges here, those are going to be the sympathetic ganglia. All right, so basically what we're going to see is, all right, the ganglion are pretty much going to be spaced at each level where a spinal nerve is exiting out of the spinal column there, which is good. So in general, we'll see one ganglion per level, uh, spinal nerve level. Now I'm going to throw a curveball at you. When we get to the neck, okay, in the cervical portion, we throw that out the window and we're only gonna give you three ganglia. You have a superior, middle, and an inferior. The superior is the largest, okay? And then the, the middle is gonna be the smallest. Right? We'll see that more in lab. So the superior cervical ganglia, those postganglionic axons are going to head out to the head, neck, and thoracic viscera. So any end organ, in the head, neck, and the thoracic region is going to be innervated by the postganglionic axon from the superior cervical ganglion. So what are some of those end organs? Here's some sweat glands for you. Sweat glands are under sympathetic innervation only. The parasympathetic nervous system does not affect sweat glands. 
which makes sense. Either you're sweating or you're not, okay? It's like a light switch. If the switch is off, there's no light. If the switch is on, there's light. Same thing with your sweat glands, okay? If the switch is on, you're sweating. If the switch is off, you're not sweating. Same thing with blood vessels. Blood vessels are only under sympathetic control. So the, the sympathetic nervous system is going to affect the diameter of your blood vessels. Remember when we were talking about the ocular motor nerve, cranial nerve three, and we said that it affects the iris sphincter muscle. It'll make your pupil smaller. That's under parasympathetic. Well, guess what? You also have another muscle in your eye called the dilator pupillae. Well, look at the name, dilator. That's exactly right. This muscle is going to dilate your pupil. It's going to make it big. How I remember that, you ever watch a cartoon? You got a cartoon character that gets scared and their eyes pop out of their head, but they get really wide. Okay, their eyes open up very wide. Well, that's what I think of, right? The eyes are open wide and the pupils get really dilated. And so that's under the sympathetic response. And then of course, you've got a muscle that sits in your upper eyelid all right, called the superior tarsal muscle, and that helps to raise or elevate your eyelid. So if you were to damage the superior cervical ganglia, you would damage that eye muscle and you'd have a droopy eye. Okay, it's called ptosis, spelled with a P though. The other two ganglia, the middle and the inferior cervical ganglia, all right, their, uh, uh, their cell bodies, all right, are going to be uh, located in the postganglionic uh, or in the ganglia, in the autonomic ganglia, but those postganglionic axons are going to innervate the thoracic viscera. So I'm going to come right back to that. I just want to show you this real fast. All right, so here you can see all right, <clears throat> the superior, middle, and inferior cervical ganglia. So the superior cervical ganglia, their postganglionic axons are going to innervate viscera in your head, in your neck, and also in the thoracic cavity. So that'll be like the heart, some of the blood vessels, the lungs, all right, those tissues. The middle and inferior ganglia, they're only going to innervate, all right, the thoracic viscera which is what you see here. So later on, all right, not tonight, but we're gonna learn and talk about all right, the other parts, because there's four different pathways that our uh, sympathetic neurons are going to innervate all these various uh, end organs right, throughout your body. So let's talk about our first clinical view of the evening, Horner syndrome. All right, Horner syndrome is what happens when we damage, okay, our cervical sympathetic trunk or the T1 ganglion. Right, this is what will happen. So say a pipe hits you uh, in the neck, okay, or you sustain a, a blow from something and you damage your cervical sympathetic trunk or your T1 trunk ganglion you're gonna present with these four things. And I can't remember, there was a, a saying that we used to say to, to, uh, to talk about this. Ah, oh, it'll come back to me. Um, but there's, these four symptoms are pretty common, okay? Ptosis, this is the one I was telling you about, when that superior tarsal muscle, right, that's the muscle that elevates your eyelid. So if we damage the nerves that innervate that muscle, right, we paralyze the muscle and your eye droops. All right, that's ptosis. Meiosis, right? We talked about this, the pupillary, the pupil, the pupillary dilator muscle. All right? Again, if we damage the nerve that innervates that muscle, it, that muscle becomes paralyzed. The parasympathetic nervous system takes over, and we know what that does. That causes constriction of the pupil. Ocular motor nerve will constrict that pupil. So we'll see a very small little black uh, opening there uh, in, in the iris there. Anhydrosis, lack of sweating. Okay, you will not be able to sweat because no sympathetic 
signals are coming to the sweat glands, so they remain in the off position. And then finally, facial flushing. Right? I told you the sympathetic division controls the diameter of your blood vessels. So if we just shut that off completely, then your blood vessels will vasodilate. And when we see vasodilation, we see increase in blood flow. Hence, you'll get facial flushing. And that's Horner syndrome. Here's the sympathetic trunk, I already showed you that. Um, let me just jump into this first uh, slide here and then we'll, we'll, call, we'll take a break. All right. Um, oh yeah, perfect, perfect, perfect. I wanna talk about these two structures here, the gray and white rami communicantes. So your spinal nerves come off of the spinal cord. They're a mixed nerve, okay? But we're only gonna deal with the motor aspect here. So one of the previous classes, I talked about how the spinal nerve, and I don't know if I have, I don't think I do. Well, I kind of do. Just zoom in here. All right, so here's our spinal cord. Here's our spinal nerve. So our spinal nerve will go about its business, and then it has a branch that comes off the backside of it. And we call that the posterior ramus. And the posterior ramus, all right, that branch is going to innervate, okay, the deep muscles of your back and the skin on your back. And then we have, after the posterior ramus, then the remaining part of the spinal nerve is known as the anterior ramus. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about these two branches here. See these two structures here? All right. These structures, you can see they're connected to our sympathetic trunk and our sympathetic ganglia here. So the white ramus communicantes and the gray ramus communicantes are these structures that will attach onto the sympathetic trunk and then back to the spinal nerve back here. All right, I just wanted to point that out to you. Because I want you to think of the white rami communicantes as the entrance ramp for the spinal or sympathetic chain highway. And we call it the white rami communicantes because it's myelinated. So this is where those preganglionic axons that are leaving the spinal cord right, are going to go into our sympathetic trunk. That's the on-ramp. The gray rami communicantes, that's going to be unmyelinated, and it's going to be made up of postganglionic axons. Okay, so the white rami is myelinated, and it's made up of preganglionic our gray rami communicantes is going to be unmyelinated and it's going to be made up of the postganglionic um, axons. And it is the exit ramp from the sympathetic trunk. All right, this is a good place for me to stop because we're about to get into some good stuff here, but I don't want to break your brains, all right, more than I may have already. Um, so let's 